Well, good evening and welcome to our Monday night Bible study. And we've got a little bit of a surprise for you tonight. We're going to change, uh, depart from our usual schedule. Uh, many of you know that I was asked to go to Israel here a few weeks ago. Uh, a dear friend of mine, Bob Cornuke, had published a very controversial book called The Temple. And it's as, it was in support of that that he asked, uh, asked us to join him for a little research trip in Israel. And we stumbled into some things that uh, surprised us. We were really going there to really explore the, the uh, confines of the Antonia Fortress versus the temple and all of that. And that's a, a controversy of its own doing. Um, but while we were there, we stumbled into something else, which leads to our study tonight. We're going to explore a strange little couple of verses in Genesis that would have disappeared into obscurity, except they were celebrated in Psalm 110, and from that, usher in a whole nother perspective. So what we're going to do tonight is that we're going to explore what I call the mystery of Melchizedek. In Genesis chapter 14, there's a battle of nine kings, and we'll take a look at that to open this up. Uh, in Genesis 14, it opens up, it says, And it came to pass... In the days of Amraphel, the king of Shinar, and Arioch, the king of Alasar, and Sherdelamer, the king of Elam, and Tidal, the king of the nations. These four kings is the focus. And uh, they made war with Bera, the king of Sodom, and Bersha, the king of Gomorrah, and Shinab, the king of Adma, and Shemember, the king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, which is Zoar. Now, by the way, I might mention that this guy, uh, Amraphel, in the Bible, is re generally recognized by commentators by his secular name, Hammurabi. If you've done any reading of ancient history, you know that Hammurabi was a code that established back then, and it's, uh, this is the same guy, apparently. And it's strange, though, that Amraphel, the king of Babylon, is mentioned first, even though... Um, Akedi Lamar is the real leader here. But moving on here, it says, All these were joined together in the Vale of Sidon, which is the Salt Sea. Twelve years they served Akedi Lamar, and in the thirteenth year they rebelled. In other words, these, these five had been subjugated by the four and paid them tribute for um, uh, twelve years. But in the thirteenth year, they got tired of that, so they rebelled. And it's interesting, we're going to see in this unfolding of this battle an example of God's promise to Abraham uh, to bless those that blessed him and curse those that cursed him. And so uh, we'll take a, a look at this as we go here. Battle of nine kings. And uh, four of them are Shemites, apparently. And uh, five of them were Hamites. And the Hamites were in subjugation to the Shemites, but they rebelled in the 13th year. And Kedalamer is the leader from Elam. He's a Persian, what we would consider a Persian, or a pre-Persian, if you will. He defeated and spoiled the rebels. So the rebels rebelled but lost. And uh, that's not the real focus where we're coming. You'll see where we're going here. But one thing they did, they, they, beat, they beat the rebels, but they made a big mistake, turned out. They took a guy by the name of Lot as a captive. And that was a shame from their point of view because Lot was the nephew of one of the most powerful tribal leaders in the region, a guy by the name of Abraham. And in the 14th year came Shkadolomar and the kings that were with him, and they smote the Rephaims and Ashtaroth Karnim and the Zumzims in, in um, Ham, and the Emims in Shaveh Keriathim, and the Horites in Mount Seir unto El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Now those names may not mean a lot to you, but if they echo familiar, that's because you've read about them as Nephilim. And so that raises some interesting issues that are peripheral or tangential to our interest tonight. But anyway, they returned and came to Emishpat, which is Kadesh, and smote all the country of the Malachites and also the Amorites that dwelt in Hazazan Tamar. I'm, I'm sure I'm mispronouncing all those, but it's tangential to our purpose anyway. But it is interesting just to mention in passing this appears, it would seem, to be a reoccurrence of the Nephilim. The Rephaim were a people defeated by Kerdelomer at Ashtoreth Karnaim, which are northeast of the Jordan Valley in a place called Perea, 
uh, before the Canaanites came. This is all pre-Canaanite uh, people here. Og, the giant king of Bashan, apparently was the last of them, according to Deuteronomy 3. And he reigned in Ashtaroth Adrai, and he was defeated by Moses as the last survivor of the remnant of the Rephaim, according to the scripture. The Zuzimim of Ham were a northern tribe of Rephaim between the Arn and the Jabbok, smitten by Kedalamer. The Ammonites who supplanted them called them by a different name, the Zamzumin. These are names that, if you've been digging into Genesis 6 and all that, uh, may be familiar to you. The Emim and Anakim and the Zamzumin were probably all the same stock, but just different names by the different tribes that came in contact with them. And the Nephilim do reoccur, you need to understand, in Numbers 13, 33, when you get to Moses and all of that. That's later. So we do know that the, the Nephilim were drowned in the flood of Noah. That's why they had the flood. But we all know, also know there was a reoccurrence of them, which Genesis 6 makes an allusion to, and they show up specifically in Numbers 13. So I'll leave that to you to dig out a little bit and get some perspective. We'll keep moving here. And they went out, the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, the same as Zor. And they joined battle with them in the vale of Siddim. With Cadet the king of Alam, and Tidal, the king of nations, and Amraphel, or Hammurabi, if you will, king of Shinar, which is a, virtually a synonym for Babylon, and uh, Arioch, king of Elisar, four kings with five. Okay. And the vale of Sin was full of slime pits. That was a disadvantage to the five. And the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled and fell there. And they that remained fled to the mountain. And they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah and all their victuals and went their way. In other words, the victors, the four kings that were successful, uh, took, took the booty of everything they captured. Okay? But they made a big mistake. In verse 12, they took Lot, Abraham's brother's son, who dwelt in Sodom and his goods and departed. Now that was, they didn't realize that Lot had some very powerful relatives that were going to jump into the picture here. And so, and they moved, they were moving incidentally along the west bank of the Dead Sea here, where it all takes place. And there came one that had escaped. And he told Abraham, the Hebrew, for he dwelt in the plain of Mamre, the Amorite brother of Eshcol, and the brother of Ur, and these were confederate with Abram. Abram had some confederates here, obviously. Um, and so, when Abram heard that his brother, that term is used collectively, it's actually his nephew, that his brother was taken captive, anyway, he armed his trained servants born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. Now that raises a lot of interesting questions here. Uh, this, by the way, is the first mention of Hebrew, which actually, the word actually means crossed over. But more to point, the question that many people ask, should Christians be prepared for battle? That's a lurking question that has different answers for different contexts, but I, it, it sort of is impacted by, here's Abraham. He was ready. He not only had an army that was trained, uh, but in anticipation of just such an emergency. And uh, so his, and his eldest servant, Abraham's eldest servant, was in a position that he would have inherited everything if Abram died. You need to understand that. He was more like what we would consider a business partner, not just a servant. That's a misleading vocabulary in our world. But uh, so his, his eldest servant was heir to his, in the absence of his own issue. And so anyway, Abram pursued these men all the way north to Damascus. So they're going from the Dead Sea all the way to Damascus to do what they're going to do here. But the very fact that he had 318 trained professional warriors in his service is staggering. And uh, so, and that he obviously had a lot more that would take care of things while he's gone. So the, the, you begin to realize that Abraham was a very, very powerful tribal leader here. And so, okay, and he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night and smote them and pursued them to Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. So they're up there. He doesn't, the, the text doesn't give us the details, but obviously Abraham used his forces very wisely. He split them into two and apparently had some chase and come around the other way. And he, at night, succeeded in wiping out the four kings that had succeeded against the five earlier. That's non-trivial military tactics, by the way. It's trivial to our purpose other than to set the stage for an event, a little event that would disappear into oblivion if it but for what we're going to get into here. 
And so anyway, Abraham, he brought back all the goods, also brought again his brother Lot and his goods and the women also and the people. They went all the way to the mountain, you know, going from the Dead Sea to the mountain. That's a, on foot, that's quite a stretch. This is a non-trivial military achievement here, but we'll just move on here. And the king of Sodom, obviously he was thrilled. He went out to meet him after his return from the slaughter of Kedil Omer and the kings that were with him at the Valley of Shaveh, which is the king's vale. And then we have this little verse 18, which comes from nowhere, that is the subject of our exploration tonight. This one little verse. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Where does he come from? And who is this that he's the priest for? In fact, he's a king and a priest. That shatters our usual conceptions that we get from reading our Bible. Here is also a thread that goes through the entire Bible. In fact, it climaxes at the Lord's Supper. Because in the Lord's Supper, Paul tells us, For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And you may think I'm crazy, but I believe what Melchizedek is doing here is, a, is an anticipation of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that starts to give this verse all kinds of overtones far beyond what we normally expect. And so this peculiar verse, verse 18, And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, okay, and he was the priest of the Most High God. How can this guy be a king and a priest? That shatters our conceptions that come from our study of the Old Testament, where the king and the priest functions were separated. The king and the priest were never, in fact, they were punished if they crossed over. Now, Salem may surprise you, but that was well known as the site of Jerusalem. And uh, that's from Psalm 76, verse 2. It has early mention in the Tel El Arman letters, that's 14th century BC. And, uh, and Syrian inscriptions long before it became an Israelite city. So it was known as Salem, but it was Jer what we know as Jerusalem. The Targumim, uh, 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 they're spoken paraphrases by the rabbis that would put things in the common language. And the Genesis Apocryphon, which is, which is one of the original seven Dead Sea Scrolls. It's a, it's a pseudobiographical conversation, not considered inspired, but it's a, it purports to be a conversation between a Lamech, the son of Methuselah, and his son Noah. So it's not an authentic, inspired document, don't misunderstand me, but it is a document that, that commemorates the, 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 the fact that Salem is a synonym for Jerusalem. That's not an um, informed scholastic debate. But the other thing that occurs in this passage we want to notice is the name for God. It's a name associated with the Gentile world. Gentiles use the, yeah, Melchizedek uses this term, and uh, it means it's a superlative. When you hear the Muslims say uh, Allah Akbar, that's a comparative. God, it really doesn't say God is great, it's God is greater, is what, it, what they always cry. Greater than whom? The God you worship. Allah is greater. This is a different, this is a superlative. The most high God is what the word means. Okay? And uh, we know this was the guy that divided the nations, the Gentiles, back in Deuteronomy 32. And we find its use all through Dan Daniel 4, which is the, the chapter that Nebuchadnezzar wrote. He always refers to God by the El Elyon label. He's the possessor of heaven and earth. And you can find him the possessor of heaven in, in the verses there. And the, I put all the verses in there so you can track these things down on your own. But what you'll discover is this peculiar title is sort of a non-Jewish title. It's a title used by Gentiles. It's used by Daniel in his Aramaic section. You know, Daniel, the book of Daniel is written in Hebrew and Aramaic, but when he's talking Aramaic, he's talking in, in, in the context of the Gentiles. And he's always in, in the Aramaic, he will use El Elyon. So we notice the subtlety here of that label, interestingly, as we dig it further into this. Okay, now getting to verse 19 of chapter 14, and he says, and he, and he, speaking of Melchizedek, and he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abraham of the Most High God. There it is again. Possessor of heaven and earth. 
And here's the strange verse, verse 20. And blessed be the most high God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. That's Melchizedek saying, well done. And then we have this sentence that shatters us. It's just full of implications we need to absorb. It says, and he, Abraham, gave him, Melchizedek, tithes of all. We're going to see a big thing being made of this later. But the fact that Abraham gave tithes to Melchizedek is huge in its implications for lots of strange reasons. Uh, the writer will later make, in Hebrews, will make the point that Levi was still in the loins of Abraham. So Abraham giving tithes to Melchizedek means that the priesthood of Levi is subordinate to the priesthood of Melchizedek. They make a big thing of that. That's, you have to think like a rabbi to follow that logic through, but that, that, that's, what, that's, that's the point of the text. And so, uh, so Melchizedek is higher and precedent to Levi as a priesthood. And he gave him tithes of all. That's a staggering verse to see tucked away in chapter 14 of Genesis. And uh, now that would be probably, uh, it would fall into obscurity if that were the end of the story. But one of the things, if you come to my Bible studies, the thing I'm hoping you carry away from that is the discovery that it's a design package. That the 66 books we call the Bible are a, pack, a message system in which every detail is there deliberately. And once you discover that for yourself, it'll change everything. And here we have this peculiar little verse tucked away in Genesis 14. And of course, we're not through yet. Now, those of you that have studied the, uh, our overview of, of the scriptures, remember this timeline, which goes from the creation, the fall of man, right on through the flood, Abraham, through the Exodus, to the cross. And, and uh, we have a, a good part of this uh, is, uh, ends up in the kingdom at the end. In fact, that kingdom is a thousand years, and a lot of people see the period from the fall of man to there as 6,000 years. The thousand years seems to fit that model. I wouldn't make too much of that, but there are people way back from the beginning, uh, Jerome and others, that made, a, bit th made, made a, a presumption there. But certainly Genesis covers most that period. Genesis goes from the creation all the way up to, but not including the Exodus. The rest of the Old Testament then takes us through to the exile. There are 400 years that are sometimes called the silent years. I'll come back to that. And then we have the New Testament, which actually covers a very short period of time. One lifetime, so to speak. And, uh, but that 400 years that people call the silent years is because they haven't done their homework in Daniel. Daniel chapter 11, verse 5 to 35 details that so precisely that skeptics have said it had to have been written later. And, uh, but, uh, so it's not, they're not silent years. They're in the scripture, but as a forecast. But anyway, so we have the whole story of the nation of Israel, the diaspora, and their restoration before the establishment of the kingdom. All that probably should be familiar ground to you. But now we suddenly discover this peculiar overlay that precedes all that and apparently endures beyond all that. And we begin to discover, by the time the evening's over, that everything, all the Jewishness, if I can call it that, from Abraham to the second coming of Christ, there's like a parenthesis it's a parenthesis in a larger study, the study of this character, Melchizedek. What is all that about? And so if that was all in Genesis 14, that'd be the end of it, except we then run into, he's a, he was a Gentile king, which would be unclean by Levitical standards. As a priest, he receives tithes from Abraham. He administers bread and wine, which catches our attention. And that bread and wine theme actually is all through the Bible. Remember when Joseph was in prison and the baker and the wine steward were co-prisoners with him. And a big thing is made of the bread and the wine in three days. And I won't get into it all here, but you can look at it in Genesis 40. That, that theme is echoed all the way through to the Lord's Supper and communion. In John 20 and so forth. The communion elements and so on. And again, we find El Elyon, the superlative non-Jewish title being used. Okay. 
So in Genesis 14, picking up that a little more. And the king of Sodom said unto Abraham, give me the persons and take the goods to thyself. He, test, he offers Abraham the booty from the battle. According to the law of Hammurabi, that was appropriate. But Abraham refuses. He declines. He was entitled to it, but he says, no, thank you. Abraham said to the king of Sodom, I have lift up mine hand unto the Lord, the most high God, the possessor of heaven and earth. He's using that same title. That I will not take a thread even to a shoe latchet, and that I will not take anything that is thine, lest thou shouldest say, I have made Abraham rich. So he re just refuses to take a penny from this guy. Save only that which the young men have already eaten, and the portion of the men which went with me, Anna, Eshkol, and Mamre, let them take their portion. They're entitled, let them have, but I, I, I yield on mine. If that were the end of it, we now move to Psalm 110. Because Psalm 110 lifts this little couple of verses in Genesis and celebrates them in a way that echoes through the rest of the Bible. Let's take a look at Psalm 110 here. And uh, the importance of Psalm 110 is attested by the unusual prominence given to it in the New Testament. Psalm 110 is, verse 1 is quoted 25 times in the New Testament. And uh, in Acts 2, Hebrews 1, Hebrews 5, 6, and 7, of course, and Hebrews 10. Verse 1 is quoted 25 times. Verse 4 of Psalm 110 itself is quoted four times in the New Testament. And Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews, 10 the quotes all, all, all put together. Now, this leads, let me insert here, one of my favorite confrontations. When in the New Testament, we find confrontations a number of places, but my favorite one is the one that occurs in Matthew 22. Because we have the main enemies of Christ. We have the Herodians. These were a political party that tried to trap him by forcing him to make a political statement that would mark him as a traitor Rome. Do you have to give tithes to Caesar? That famous event was prompted by the Herodians. And he confused them. He, he, they, that failed. The Sadducees then step in and they take a shot. They're the liberal religious party. They don't believe in the resurrection and so on. They tried to trap him with a ridiculous question regarding the Mosaic law and that also failed. And you can look that all up in Matthew 22. Then you get to the Pharisees. That's the conservative, the religious political party that tried to trap him and Jesus' answer puzzled them. So we have all three of these groups presented a, a tricky question that he confuses them with. So then he turns around and says, can I ask you a question? I love this. I really love this. They huddle again to plan a further strategy. Jesus asked them a question. I, love, I really love this. Matthew 22. We'll pick it up about verse 41. While the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them, saying, What think ye of Christ? Whose son is he? They came back with the obvious answer. They said unto him, The son of David. And that's no surprise. There's plenty of scripture on that. They were on sound ground. And then he saith to them, well, how then doth David in spirit call him Lord? Now, by the way, something not to miss here, that demonstrates that Jesus regarded David's words as inspired scripture. Because he alludes to David having said in spirit. So there's a little authentication here you may miss unless you watch for it. That, uh, he sp that David spoke this in spirit. How then doth David in spirit call him Lord, saying, and then what Jesus does, he quotes Psalm 110 verse 1. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my, on my right hand till I make thine enemies thy footstool. A very familiar psalm, obviously, to all of them. How can David say that if, he's, if the Messiah is the son of David? If David then call him Lord, how is he his son? That's his question. Now, we're dealing with lawyers. You've got to do your homework. You've got to be sharp. And these guys were totally befuddled. And one of my favorite verses is, by the way, the son of David is well documented. And in Proverbs 30, verse 4, Who hath ascended up to heaven or descended and to gather the winds in his fists and bound the waters in garments? Who hath established all? That's obviously God. What is his name and what is his son's name if thou canst tell? That's a real dilemma to the rabbis. Okay, what is his name and what is his son's name? But getting back to this, I love the way Matthew 22 finishes because they could not answer his question 
And it says, I love the last verse of Matthew 22. No man was able to answer him a word. <laughs> Neither durst any man from that day forth ask him any more questions. <laughs> so I love that. He really uh, sent them with their tail between the legs, as somebody might say. And so this psalm is telling us, by the way, that Jesus Christ was virgin born. And, uh, and Hebrews picks that up in chapter 1. But to which of the angels had he said any time, sit thou at my right hand, make the enemy's footstool. But we'll move on here. Psalm 110 verse 1, we may miss the point that Jesus built his whole argument on. Because if you look at that psalm, Psalm 110 says, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. See, that's in the English. You don't pick up the little problem that's tucked away in this. If you look at the Hebrew there, uh, if you look at that, you probably recognize yod heh vav the, the name of God tucked away in there. But it's the next word that's the key to all this, Adonai, the Lord. But the word Adonai has a very peculiar little mark after it. And that is the smallest of all the Hebrew letters. It's called a yot. When it's used the way it's used there, it makes the Adonai possessive. It's my Lord. How can David call him my Lord if he's a son? That's what they couldn't, they couldn't answer because of that yod sitting there. Now, why am I making such a big thing of this? Because Jesus has given us a precious instruction we need to take, absorb. We find that in Matthew 5, starting in verse 17 and 18. Jesus said, think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill. And notice what he says here. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one yacht and one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. Now Jesus gives us an insight here that is incredibly profound. One yacht or one tittle, that, those are Hebraisms. A yacht is something that we would think of as a dot on an eye. The tittle is the little hook on, that separates certain letters. The, our equivalent in our vocabulary would be not the, uh, the uh, dotting of an I or the crossing of a T. In other words, what Jesus is telling us to do is to regard the text seriously, down to the parts of a letter. That's staggering, staggering insight into the field of hermeneutics. One of the big debate arenas is hermeneutics, your theory of interpretation. Jesus guided us here to take the text very, very seriously. We now know by studying the Old Testament and the Torah, especially with computers, that it has all kinds of amazing properties, and yet if you remove one letter, they all fall apart. And it's shocking to realize from all that that God not only gave Moses the Torah, he gave it to him letter by letter. And once you realize that, it changes your attitude to the original text. Not a trend. We always still have translational issues, but the original text. So I leave that with you as a byproduct here. Psalm 110 continues, The Lord shall send the wrath of thy strength out of Zion to rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. This verse speaks to the coming of Christ to the earth, to the earth, to rule in Zion. It's astonishing to realize there's probably none, not one church in ten in America that believe that. That he's going to literally come back to rule the earth from Zion. That's what it says. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power, in the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, for thou hast the dew of thy youth. And then we encounter verse 4 of Psalm 110 that nails this thing to the wall. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek. Now that raises several issues here. One of the issues, why does God swear? Why does God have to swear an oath? Because he's declaring something about which that he is not free to change his mind. Other things he may say, he has prerogatives. Here he does not. That's why he's swearing an oath. The Lord has sworn and will not repent. The whole book of, of uh, Hebrews deals with searching for repentance, and most people who read that book don't understand it's not the repentance of the junior that's at issue, it's the repentance of the senior. And the writer uses that in his examples. We'll get to that later. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art, who's thou? Who? 
the Son of God, Jesus. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Levi. No, 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 no. After the order of Melchizedek, a king and a priest. So suddenly this little verse tucked away in Genesis 14 gets elevated to a serious issue here. But this is the last said of it in the Old Testament. It still would probably disappear into oblivion if it wasn't for what follows after this. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. And, and, and in fact, Psalm 10 goes on and says, The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. Ooh. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He will wound the heads over many countries. You've got to be kidding. That's Jesus. Wow. I love those bumper stickers you see in Orange County occasionally. It says, Jesus is coming soon, and boy, is he angry. <laughs> Another one says, beware the lamb. <laughs> I like that one. He shall drink of the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head, and on it goes. Psalm 110. Psalm 110 affirms the deity of Jesus, answering those that would deny the full divine meaning of his New Testament title, Lord. It really defines his title of lo as Lord, not just Savior, Lord. It announces the eternal priesthood of Messiah. One of the most important statements in all of Scripture is here in Psalm 110. And I put verses there so you can, in your own time, chase those down and do your own study. But it goes on. Historically, Psalm 110 begins with the ascension of Christ. Prophetically, it looks to two things. A, the time when Christ will appear as the rod of yod strength, a, devil, a deliverer out of Zion that Romans 11 talks about, and the conversion of Israel, of course. But it also talks about the judgment upon the Gentile powers which precedes the establishment of the kingdom. Wow. And that's something we need to talk more about. Okay, if that was it, let's go on and see what the New Testament has to say. And we discover in Hebrews, three chapters are going to hammer away at this whole issue of Melchizedek. What on earth is that really all about? Now, the epistle of the Hebrews, let's just stand back and take a look at this interesting epistle. It has uh, the first seven uh, chapters deal with Jesus, the new and better deliverer. The God man's better than the angels, the apostle better than Moses, the leader better than Joshua, the, and a priest better than Aaron. So the writer is trying to demonstrate that Jesus is superior to all of those concepts. Those are very important concepts in the Old Testament, but Jesus is superior to all of them. That's the, ma the main theme of the first seven chapters. And he has also a better covenant, next few chapters, a better sanctuary, a better sacrifice, and those are things that he demonstrates in the text. And that the practical applications of all this in chapters 10 to through 13. We call it the hall of faith and the exhortation to endurance and so forth. That outline is very valid except it overlooks five warnings. There are five warnings. There's a first warning of five in chapter 2, a second warning in chapter 3, a third warning in chapter 5, another one in chapter 10, and a final one in chapter 12. There are five specific warnings and when you study them, you discover some interesting things. Those five major warnings include the danger of drifting, the danger of disobedience, progress towards maturity is the concern, danger of willful sin, and finally warning against being indifferent, lukewarm. Now notice something is very urgent to, all the way through this. The entire Hebrew, Hebrew, book of Hebrews was written to Christians. These people, their salvation is not the issue here. But they're, they're in danger of drifting, disobedience, maturity, willful sin, so forth. And so these warnings are often misunderstood by people who don't realize the writer is talking to Christians. The unity of the five warnings, they're all a unit as such. They go together and complement each other. Each builds on the other. Each intensifies until the fifth capstone. The writer relies heavily on Israel's exodus as an exemplar type for individual Christians. All the way through Hebrews, the writer uses Kedesh Barnea as a, a model to study. And what's interesting is what people miss is the issue of repentance there is, is not the junior, it's the senior. We'll get back to that. The Exodus generation, a redeemed people, failed to heed God's instruction and was judged for its disobedience. That's the point the writer is making. And so, five warnings of Hebrews. All were written to believers. They do not represent any chance of loss to the past aspect of salvation. That is justification. 
Hence, the eternal security of the believer underscores the entire thing. The warnings admonish believers to press on and obtain all God has promised to the faithful overcomer. That's the burden of the writer. It's not salvation. He takes that for granted. It's your progress since you've been saved. What, what next? The warnings represent the very real possibility of the loss of privileges or rewards offered to the believer, which will be revealed at the judgment seat of Christ. Ooh, really? Absolutely. What's at stake here? What are these believers going to lose, forfeit, or suffer? That's the lurking question here. Not salvation. You can nail that from other scripture very easily. It's the rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. And we cannot escape this by applying it to others. It's designed to us. The burden of Hebrews is not the rescuing of sinners from hell. That's not the burden. That's not the issue. It's the bringing of sons to glory. That's from end to end, the burden of the writer. Okay. Five contrasts are made. Jesus has a better position. He's a better priest. New priesthood is better in a better covenant. The priesthood functions in a better sanctuary. And uh, it's based on a better sacrifice. The whole point of Hebrews all the way through is better, better position, better priest, better covenant, better sanctuary, better that Jesus supersedes all that you've been taught. So we're going to su try to summarize this complex book in just a few segments here. So understand there's no way I can summarize the whole book here in the few minutes we have. But let's take a look at it here. Hebrews 5, 7. Who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplication with strong crying and tears unto him, who was able to save him from death, was heard in that he feared. His request for deliverance was granted fully in the resurrection and its proclamation of death defeated. The resurrection of Christ validates all that. Though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. Really? He learned obedience? He learned from the things which he suffered, which of course is a play on words caught up in the Greek proverb, amathen epathen. But uh, basically, being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him. Called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Oops, there it is again. It is finished to tell us die, paid in full. Salvation to all that obey him. The obedience addressed here is not the obedience of works. Because salvation is never by works. This obedience is the obedience of faith. And there's plenty of verses you can track that down on your own. And called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. There's that emphasis again. Now, now the writer here issues a very interesting rebuke. The author of the Hebrews develops the topic of the priesthood. He now interrupts his argument to give us a preamble to his warning, warning number three. It's a warning about stagnation. The failure to progress to spiritual maturity is his burden. He's not talking about getting saved. He's talking about getting mature of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Notice how he flatters his students. <laughs> I'm being facetious. Of whom? The whom is Melchizedek and the order of Melchizedek. And we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing ye are dull of hearing. Every believer must develop a sensitive hearing of things which are hard of interpretation. Every believer must mature in order to handle the deeper things of biblical doctrine. And you're going to be shocked with what the writer continues here. The writer plainly states that his readers are in no condition to receive the subsequent teaching he feels obligated to give them. Wow. What's he saying? That his readers are in no condition to receive the subsequent teaching he feels obligated to give them. I want to give you something, but you're not ready. You can't handle it. He calls them, his readers, immature, backward, untaught, and dull of hearing. That obviously doesn't include any of you, I'm sure. <laughs> and the Greek word for dull means to have no push, lazy or sluggish in hearing. Okay. For when, for when for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God. Ye are become such as have need of milk 
and not of strong meat. So he's scolding them because they are still in milk, not in strong meat. These are not new believers. If they were new baby believers, their inability to understand would be excusable. He's implying that it's not excusable. He accuses them of regression, failing to advance. Oh, that's for a show of hands. Anyone here in the camp? Okay, I'll leave that alone. All right, we'll go on here. First principle of the oracles of God. The problem is that these topics belong to the category of strong food and not milk. Wow, I really want to find out what's he talking about? What is it that they are not equipped to receive? Let's skip ahead and find out what that's all about. We'll do that in chapter 7. They have need of, such as have need of milk and not of strong meat, really. The need, their need to develop spiritually in order to show ability in teaching instead of being retaught the same things over and over again is, is, the, is the problem they're facing. What is the stronger food? The milk of the word refers to what Jesus did on earth. His birth, his life, his teaching, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. Wow, we, we know about that, right? The meat of the word refers to what Jesus Christ is now doing in heaven. Really? What is he doing? This is going to be developed in chapter 7 of the Epistle of Hebrews. Okay? They're believers. Their justification is not an issue here. Judgment, not mercy, will emanate from the beam of seed with a just recompense of reward for works, positive and negative, is appropriate. And there's plenty of verses you can dig in on that. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation, though we thus speak. Feel a little bit of relief there? Okay. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which ye have showed towards his name, in that ye have ministered to the saints and do minister. So he's given credit where due, that accompanies salvation. Believers who press on to maturity receive God's blessing and rewards for Messianic kingdom because they have lived a useful life for the Lord. I like the way Dan Stolberg uses, what have you done for Christ's sake? <laughs> it sounds offensive until you understand what he's saying here. We desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end. That ye be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Really, there's promises to be inherited here. Really. Which of the promises are optional? That's your assignment. Dig them out. Find out. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swore by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. So after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Understand what the writer is saying. Understand his vocabulary here. Okay? He could swear by no greater. Abraham exercised 25 years of patient endurance to obtain the promise of Isaac. 25 years. Continuing. For men verily swear by greater, and the oath for the confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed by no. In other words, he cannot change it. Immutability means he can't change it. The oath renders it immutable, unchangeable, not open to repentance. The searching for repentance in the book of Hebrews is more often the, the repentance of the senior, and the writer makes that very clear in chapter 10. That by two immutable things in which it was possible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. I love that. My wife uses that on her cover of her new book. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. Both sure and steadfast and which entereth into that within the veil. See, the promise and the oath were unconditional guarantees of the covenant. When Abraham was 75 years old, God promised him a son. The promise contained the content of the covenant. But the promise with an oath was given when he was 99 years old, Genesis 17. So there is a distinction between those two. Okay. Whether the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, here it comes again, made a high priest forever after what? The order of Melchizedek. There it is again. Nailed right between, right on our forehead. There it is. Okay. Mentioning the order, the author picks up now where he left off back in chapter 5. 
Either he told, earlier he told his readers why they might not be able to understand these difficult truths. These are not trivial things. This is advanced training, so to speak. Having again encouraged them to press on to maturity, he is now ready to expound on the Melchizedekian order. Okay. For those priests who were made, this is chapter 7, for those priests who were made without an oath, speaking of the Le Levitical priests, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, the Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Levitical priests never had that kind of a, uh, a commitment. Melchizedek has that kind of a commitment. He's contrasting the Aaronic priests with the kingdom of the everlasting priest. The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever. So this eclipses everything we've learned that of, the, of the Jewish model. The Judah, Leviticus, all that sort of thing. Again, swearing an oath forecloses any opportunity to repent or change his mind. Melchizedek, king of righteousness, really, yes. King of Salem, Jerusalem that is. And a priest of the Most High God, both together. He received tithes of Abraham. It's the only mention in the Old Testament, of course, in contrast with the Levitical priesthood, which is unclean mortal. Separation of the priesthood uh, between Levi and kingship is central to our whole teaching throughout the Old Testament. Two elements provided by Melchizedek are also emphasized, strangely, bread and wine. And I love what Paul clear, clarifies for us in 1 Corinthians 11. For as often as ye drink this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. And I believe that's true of the bread and wine that Melchizedek administered to Abraham. Abraham knew that he was acting out prophecy. He knew that Isaac would have to be uh, resurrected. So, okay, Abraham paid him tithes. He blessed Abraham. He's the type of a priest who lives forever. Levi, yet unborn, paid him tithes in the person of Abraham. Levi is viewed as being inside Abraham when, when those tithes were granted. The permanence of his priesthood in Christ implied the abrogation of the Levitical system. He was made a priest not without an oath, and his priesthood can neither be transmitted nor interrupted by death. This man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood is the point. And that's why there is no genealogy nor any, nor any death of Melchizedek recorded in the scripture. That was delivered by the Holy Spirit. So it would fit the model. Now, these are all kinds of speculations, of course. The fact there's no recorded birth or death caused all kinds of people to come up with theories. Okay, was, he, was Melchizedek Shem? So a lot of people think that. No, because we know Shem's genealogy. And we don't know Melchizedek's. Was Melchizedek Christ? No, his priesthood was after the order of in the similitude of Melchizedek, chapter 7. Was Melchizedek a celestial being? No. He was a man, according to Hebrews chapter 7. So all these speculations are based on not understanding chapter 7. He was a type of Christ, emphasized by the writer of Hebrews in chapter 7. He was a king of righteousness and peace. Work of righteousness shall be peace, righteousness, peace, and joy. He made peace through the blood of Jesus, justified by faith. We have peace with God. And on it goes, there's plenty of this. And this is the fun one, I think. Even the false Christ uses this title, Adonai Zedek, as a false title. Joshua is an anticipatory model of the book of Revelation. Joshua's adversaries align themselves under their leader, Adonai Zedek. It's exactly what happens in Revelation 13. So it was Satan's counterfeit. And they're defeated in the battle of Beth Horon in Joshua with stones from the sun and moon. It's exactly what happens in, in Revelation. The kings hide in caves and say, fall on us. In Joshua and Revelation, it's astonishing to see how Joshua, the book of Joshua, is a structural anticipation of the whole book of Revelation. I'll let you dig that out on your own. It's exciting. Okay, so David predicted the order of Melchizedek would replace the Levitical priesthood. The development of the ultimate priesthood will occupy chapters 7 through 10. The very material that was too strong to nourish babes. The very material that you were not able to take is what he's dealing with here in, in, in this what follows. But let's shift now from Hebrews. Let's cheat and go to the end of the book. Like any good textbook, all the answers in the back. So we're going to sh shift to Revelation chapter 5, the throne room itself. And uh, let's see what happens there. Now, Revelation is an interesting book because it provides you its own outline 
of how it's organized. He's, uh, John's told to write the things which thou hast seen, the things which are, and the things shall be hereafter. And it turns out that divides the book into three parts. The vision of Christ occupies chapter 1. And the identities there are then used throughout the rest of the book. And the things which are, the seven churches were existing at that time. The most important part of the book for us is chapters 2 and 3. But it's interesting, the things which shall be hereafter, interesting term. It's that which follows after the churches. The word is metatauta, hereafter. And we're, the, the scene's gonna, going, going to uh, shift here for us. The things which shall be hereafter. And so, first, the first verse of chapter 4, right after the seven letters, we have chapter 4, verse 1. After this, I looked, and the word after this is metatauta in the Hebrew, in the Greek, excuse me. Metatauta, after these things. And uh, after this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice I heard was, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. The word hereafter is the same word, metatauta. That's a code word, a key word, that partitions this for us. So this is why we draw the inference, this is where the rapture takes place. And um, so it opens, and how do, I, how do I know that? Well, it's confirmed for us. Um, we had... Uh, in Revelation chapter 4, verse 5, it says, Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Well, if you've been paying attention there, you may recall the seven spirits of God are identified for you, their identity in chapter 1. In chapter 1, verse 20, it says, The mystery of the seven stars, which thou sawest my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the messengers or angels of the seven churches, the seven lampstands, which thou sawest, are seven churches. So the things that are on the earth in chapter 1 are in heaven in chapter 4, verse 5. So that's again confirming this, this, this uh, perspective that we're dealing with here. And so, now by the way, it's kind of interesting that you find all this in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. But in Daniel's vision of the throne of God with all this going on, he does not see any 24 elders. The 24 elders seem to be hidden from the Old Testament, strangely enough. And Paul explains why in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3 to 7. We'll go on from that here. What we're really setting the stage for is the seven-sealed scroll. And you probably won't really understand what's going on here unless you've done a study of the book of Ruth. But we're getting ahead of ourselves here. Revelation chapter 5. And it says, I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne... Written within a book written within and on the backside, sealed with seven seals. For you Californians, this is the ultimate escrow closing. An escrow is going to close here. And uh, so these, these uh, seal, the sealed book is a title deed, it turns out. And uh, so Roman law required that I will be sealed with seven seals, as illustrated by the wills left by Augustus and Vespasian and others. But anyway, we'll move on here. And I saw a strong angel proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to loose the seals thereof? Wow, there's a mystery theater. No man in heaven nor on earth, neither under the earth, was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. Had to be a man. No man in heaven nor on earth or in anywhere was able. Had to be a kinsman of Adam. Now, you and I don't, we don't know what's going on here. John did. Because I, I sobbed convulsively is what it actually says. I wept much. Because no man was found worthy to open and to read the book, neither to look thereon. And of course, now he's, that's why he's crying. But it's always interesting to me that he's always, ex one of the elders is the one that's coaching him and explaining what's going on. And one of the elders said unto him, Weep not. Behold, the line of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, hath prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals thereof. Whoops. Fortunately, there's an exception. There is a man that is worthy to open the book. Had to be a man. Had to be worthy. And John says, he turned, he says, And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, oh, really, stood a lamb as that had been slain, having seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Now, these are obviously all very Jewish titles that we're looking at here. The line of the tribe of Judah, Pretty straightforward. That's the way John the Baptist first introduced Christ publicly. Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. At the very beginning of his ministry, he's identified 
as the Passover lamb. The root of David, fair enough. And uh, the lamb as it had been slain. Ooh, he's standing there, opening the book. Yeshua HaMashiach. He's a lion. He, that's, a, that's a label that gets from Jacob's final blessing on his sons in Genesis 49. The root of David, which is all through the scripture. And uh, he was a result of David's line. He was the one they brought David into existence. And he used this paradox to baffle the Pharisees, as we just looked at in chapter 22, Matthew 22. In God's covenant with David, his line was to rule over all the earth, not just, the, not just Israel, the whole earth. And this was all confirmed to Mary, by the way, in chapter 1 of Luke. Those of you who have studied the book of Ruth, you're familiar with this. Boaz, of course, is the Goel, the kinsman redeemer. We have to understand the book, you have to understand the law of redemption, so how the, Naomi gets her land back. And the law of the Leverite marriage, where Ruth is a Gentile bride, even though it was prohibited by the law. What the law couldn't do, Grace did. And how that redemption was sealed, and so forth. Once you understand those, that modeling in Ruth, you discover a lot of interest. Goal, of course, is the kinsman redeemer. He's got to be a kinsman. He's got to be able to perform. He's got to be willing to perform. He's got to assume all the obligations involved. And he does. Boaz, of course, is the lord of the harvest, the kinsman redeemer. Naomi is a model of Israel, exiled from her land, but redeemed. And Ruth is the Gentile bride of Boaz. And as you see that all unfold, it's thrilling to get through that book. A little tiny book. In fact, we learned some interesting things. In order to bring Ruth to Naomi, Naomi had to be exiled from her land. Really? Yeah. What the law could not do, Grace did. Ruth does not replace Naomi. Ruth learns of Boaz's ways through Naomi. But Naomi meets Boaz through Ruth. Think those through in terms of the typology here. No matter how much Boaz loved Ruth, he waited for her move. And it's Boaz, not Ruth, that confronts the nearer kinsman. That was her job, but Boaz steps in and is her advocate. He not only he consumes the deal for her. Well, let's get back to Revelation 5. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat on the throne. And when he had taken the book, the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Wow, okay. But it turns out, <laughs> this 24 and elders, what do they represent? Many people are confused by that. It's a strange metaphor to be using here. The 24 elders, they represent a completed group of some kind, as First Chronicles 24, but they cannot be the following. They can't be tribulation believers. Why? Because in chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, they are described separately as a different group. It says, and one of the elders has saying to me, what are these which are rich and arrayed in white and robes? Where came they? And I said, sir, you know, for these are them which came out of the great tribulation. But that's an elder explaining it to John. He's not one of them. And so, okay. Can they be angels? No, because in Revelation 7, verse 11, they're separate. All the angels stood round about the throne and about the elders and the four beasts and fell before. So in other words, they're separate. They're not, they're not angels. Okay. Okay, so they're not... Tribulation, they're not angels. They're not the nation of Israel. Chapter 7 and 12 deal with that. What are their distinguishing characteristics of 24 elders? Well, they have thrones. That's surprising. They have white raiment. Okay, that's a big deal. Crowns of gold. They sing the song of the redeemed. Ah, that's where we get their identity. Chapter 5, verse 9 and 10. They're called elders and kings and priests in chapter 10. Let's take a look at that. And they, the 24 elders, and they sung a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation, and has made us unto our God kings and priests, and we shall reign on the earth. This song of the redeemed tells you who they represent very clearly. The, the word us, God, uh, made us unto our God, and we shall reign on the earth. The identity is because there's 25 manuscripts that endorse that. Of the 25, there's one that has it a little confused. And the seven hands, horns and seven eyes, we've had those idioms before. But the whole thing gets nailed, if I may, in the first chapter of Revelation. 
Because when you open chapter, chapter 1, verse 5, it says, Unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood, and hath made who? Us, kings and priests, unto God his Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Praise his holy name indeed. You and I are the kings and priests. There are only three people in the Bible that are kings and priests. Melchizedek, the Lord Jesus, and his redeemed. And I hope you're sitting there realizing what he just said. Now, a lot of people argue that the book, Epistle to the Hebrews was not written by Paul. And I'm fascinated by that because the people who argue that are typically commentators who miss the point of the book in the first place. But the, the book is, the, the, there are three books that are written around a trilogy on Habakkuk 2.4. Habakkuk 2.4, Behold, his soul lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. That phrase is celebrated in three epistles. The just shall live by faith. Who are the just? Paul answers that with the book of Romans. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 17, he quotes that verse as the key that leads to the whole book defining justification. It's the book of the Bible that does that. Well, the just shall live. How shall the just live? That's what Galatians chapter 3, Galatians deals with in chapter 3, verse 11, quotes Habakkuk 4, and the whole book is an amplification that you live by faith, not works. And then, how shall the just live? By faith is emphasized, and that's Hebrews 10.38. It quotes Habakkuk 2.4, and we, it, that verse occurs just before the chapter we like to call the Hall of Faith. So these three epistles become a trilogy on Habakkuk 2.4, and it's the trilogy for you and me today. Now, the only reason I tucked this into this study, it's one of the several reasons I'm convinced that Paul did write Hebrews. That's not essential to agree with, just read the book for itself. But there's very good reasons why Paul decided not to sign it. And, and there's a whole story behind that. But uh, we know that, uh, that the writers, the, the readers of, Heder, of Hebrews knew who he was. And there's a whole thing you can get into, but I didn't want to derail the study there. Well, we just got back from visiting Zion. And um, that, that Bob Kernuk's uh, request, we went there and, uh, to visit the city of David. And our primary interest was evidences that would help us with the location of Solomon's temple and the Antonia Fortress and all of that. And Paul's book will stand on its own feet. It's getting some very fascinating endorsements uh, anyway, but that's why we went there. As we're underneath the city of David, Bob Cornuke, Lewis Powell, Ron Hudson, and myself, June 22nd of 2014, in pursuit of Zion evidences and so forth, we stumble on something else. We get into an area here that has a place, a, a, a place for um, squeezing um, olive or oil. We have these, a place that has these strange things in the ground. We don't know what they are. We suspect they were to hold framework for preparing an offering. And this other area that we're going to take a look at here in a minute. These things in the ground, we don't know what they are. We're guessing, we think they might be some kind of contrivance when you hang an offering be be between the time it's killed and, and it's offered, it's, 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 it's hanging. And that's, uh, we think that may be what these are. We don't know. They're very strange and much studied. But the key to the whole thing is a little thing in one corner here. It's a stele, which is a slab, usually oblong, not forming the part of a, a, stru uh, a structure, but it's set up in a vertical position. It's for a votive purpose or memorial to some person or event. Votive means it's offered, given, or undertaken, or performed, or dedicated in fulfillment or in accordance with a vow. Now, this one is, has no grinding out, which is the Hebrew style. They don't engrave them. It suddenly occurred to us, and it's a tentative judgment at this point, but we believe the stele was put up by Melchizedek because it's pre, it's before the things we were looking for. It's earlier. We came out of that climb stunned. It's almost as if the whole Melchizedekian uh, thing started before Abraham 
and continues after the second coming of Christ. All that we've learned from Abraham through the second coming of, is like a parenthesis around a larger priesthood. And uh, one that's eternal at both ends, interestingly enough. But I think it's time, by the way, to set the record straight in another way, if I may. Chances are Jesus isn't who you think he is. No matter what you may have read before about this first century rabbi from Nazareth, there's a good possibility that you have been misinformed. In fact, maybe you've been wrong from the start about the most amazing man who ever walked the surface of the earth. Really. In some ways, though, many people who knew Jesus understood him well enough to admire him, to respect him, and to love him. However, there are some that thought he was insane. There are others that were terrified of him. Still others hated him. In fact, the politically and religiously intolerant people in charge of Israel murdered him. But that isn't the end of the story, <laughs> not by a long shot. We published a book called I, Jesus, an Autobiography. More than 20 centuries later, William Welly and I bring Jesus of Nazareth to you in the most unconventional way possible by bringing Jesus of Nazareth to talk in his, own, his very own words about himself, his purpose, his nature, and his mission. By the time you've finished reading I, Jesus, an Autobiography, you'll have learned why this rabbi from Nazareth rose from literal obscurity, as well as from the grave, to change the very course of history. It's a very different approach. It's his own words that we, that uh, all we've done is put it in order. So with that, let's have a closing word of prayer. Father, we thank you for who you are, and we thank you for the extremes that you've gone to on our behalf. We can hardly contain it. And we thank you for this fascinating insight into this priesthood of Melchizedek. Help us understand what you have here for us. Help us to understand more clearly what you would have of us in response to all these things. As we commit ourselves to the strong food, as we commit ourselves to Yeshua HaMashiach, our Messiah, our King, our Lord, indeed. In His most holy name we commit these things. Amen. Amen.